Hello and welcome to this introduction of the project The Cross in the Torah with the subtitle The Life and Suffering of Jesus in the Five Books of Moses. My name is Matthias, which is a German counterpart of Matthew, and I'm looking forward to this opportunity to share this project with you as something to think about and also as something to encourage you. Before we start with the in-depth introduction, let me give you a one or two minute summary of this project, which will help you to determine whether or not it is of interest for you, since time is valuable. Through the title and subtitle, which contain words like cross and Jesus and Moses, you might have already picked up on the hint that this project is somehow rooted in the sphere of faith or religion. And you would be right. This project is connected to three major world religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, and it starts from a common ground, the Torah. This is probably the only term within the title of this project which you might not be familiar with. And this is why I pointed out in the subtitle, the Torah is a set of five books from Moses, the prophet Moses. We will start from the common ground that the Torah is important within those three world religions, and from that common ground we will move on to some major differences which should be pointed out as well. Then we will discuss the perspective from which this project is looking at the Torah. A perspective which will point out examples how the life and the suffering of Jesus, or Yeshua as his name is pronounced in Hebrew, is already foreshadowed within the Torah. Jesus is not only announced in the prophets of the Tanakh, of the Jewish scriptures, also known as the Old Testament for Christians. But as early as 2000 years before Christ was born, we can see him in the five books of Moses, which is also called the Law. So this is it. This is the content of the project in a nutshell. You can see that this project is mainly geared towards Jews and Muslims, and especially Christians who want to share the gospel with our Jewish and Muslim friends. But even if you do not find yourself in those groups, I hope that you are interested and that you will stick around. Because I think that there is a lot to learn from this project. At least I can say that I have learned a lot from it. So once again, welcome. You notice straight away two things. First of all, there is a graphical part to this project and everything else revolves around that. Secondly, you notice, it is difficult to read the text, the fine print on the project poster on this video. Throughout the presentation, the respective parts of the poster we are talking about will be enlarged so it is easier for you to follow. On top of that, there is a website behind this project. You can find the link in the description box. Throughout the presentation, I will reference sources, that's books, websites, articles, or other videos, etc. And if you want to check me out, which I hope you do, you can dig into the subject deeper for yourself. There is also a download section on this website, where you can download a couple of things. First of all, a high-resolution PDF version of the project poster, on which you can zoom in and see all the details. You will find it much easier to read the text there as well. Secondly, you will find an ebook which pretty much summarizes the content of the website with all the references, hyperlinks, etc. You will also find the ebook in booklet form. You can print it out, both front and back page, fold it in the middle, staple it together, and you have a small booklet. The benefit of this booklet is that you can make notes during the videos, the graphical elements for the individual books of the Torah will be much larger and you can give it away should you find this project to be helpful for someone you know. So from the start, let me briefly point out to you the structure of this in-depth introduction. First of all, we will look at how the cross in the Torah started, which will lead directly to the motivation of this project. Then the second and third point will deal mainly with Islam and Christianity, and we will move from the common ground to some major differences which are very important as well. Then we get specific and come to the main thrust of this project, Jesus in the Torah. What is the basis for this claim that Jesus is mentioned in the Torah and why is it important? For that we will look into the shadow principle which is necessary to understand the method how we can find, how we can see Jesus in the Torah. And finally, at the end of this introduction video, we will look at the structure of the project poster. So I will guide you through the poster step by step, so it will be easier for you in the following videos to find your way around. 
Well, that's a lot of material, so we better get started. From the start, I would like to do something which might not seem very wise from a worldly perspective. I want to tell you that from a professional point of view, I'm not really qualified for this project. I am neither a quote-unquote professional theologian who has a degree in religious studies, nor am I a professional artist or designer. I studied and worked in the field of mechanical engineering, so I'm an engineer. All I bring to the table with this project is my knowledge of the Bible and the knowledge which I've gained through privately studying Islam and Judaism in my free time. So what does all of this have to do with the world map you can see here? As an engineer, I worked in the German automobile industry for four years before I decided to quit my job and travel around the world. My initial goal was to hitchhike all the way from Frankfurt on Main, Germany, to Australia. And along the way, I wanted to share the gospel with the people God would put on my path. That was my motivation. To make it short, the hitchhiking part went well all the way through Europe, Turkey and into Iran. From that point on, things were kind of no longer in my hands. But that's a long story in itself. If you want to find out more about this journey, which changed my life and the way I see the world and God, you can go to this website, also linked in the description box, and read the book Destination Unknown once it is finished. Up till now, only two preliminary chapters are online. I hope to finish the book sometime in 2020. So, in late August of 2018, I arrived in Iran. And that's where the cross in the Torah started. For the major part of my time in Iran, I stayed with one family. I taught a young Iranian engineer how to read and to write German, and in exchange they shared their home with me. Interesting for me was that right on the first day when I arrived at my host's place, I was told that a very important religious celebration would take place on the following day with the name Eid Gorban. That's the best way I know how to pronounce it, Eid Gorban. Since Iran is also called the Islamic Republic of Iran, I knew that this celebration would be an Islamic one as well. And immediately the question arose for me, can I take part in this celebration? On the one hand, I didn't want to offend my host, especially not on the first day of my stay. But on the other hand, I also knew that I could not go against my convictions, since I'm a Christian and my faith in, or better said, my relationship to God is the most valuable thing for me in my life. So I did some research on this particular religious celebration with the name Eid Korban, and what I found was absolutely fascinating for me. The basis for this celebration was, and still is, a story which I can also read in my Bible. In Genesis chapter 22, we read how God tested Abraham's faith and told him to sacrifice his son for him. Now, in the Bible it is clearly stated that this son was Isaac. In the Quran, in Surah 37, Ayah 102 to 108, the name of the son is not explicitly mentioned. From the context, there is a debate going on whether that son was Ishmael or Isaac. But the storyline itself is pretty much the same, even though the account in the Quran is much shorter. The reason that the Christian Bible and the Islamic Quran incorporate this story is that both go back to a common source, the Torah. So let's quickly establish what the Torah is, so we can keep this in the back of our minds throughout the project. As mentioned earlier, the Torah consists out of five books of Moses, or Musa, and it describes the early history of the people of Israel, starting with Abraham, or Ibrahim as he is called in the Quran. The Torah is part of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, and it is fully incorporated in the Christian Bible in the Old Testament. When we come to the Quran, we notice that the Torah is only partially incorporated, in bits and pieces so to speak, and it is also not in chronological order. What is even more interesting, however, is that the Quran again and again acknowledges the importance of the Torah, which we will see on the next slide. We read, for example, in Surah 5, Ayah 42 to 47, that the Torah was sent down by Allah as the scripture of Allah, as the judgment of Allah, as guidance and light, as instruction for the righteous, that Jesus, the son of Mary, confirmed the Torah with the gospel, and the next one I personally find most interesting, 
Whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, those are the defiantly disobedient. I have summarized those points from Sahih International. You can also read on in Surah 5, Ayah 66-68, to where the Quran continues to acknowledge the importance of the Torah. So you see, there is a certain amount of overlap between Islam and Christianity. And this overlap does not stop with the Torah. Muslims believe also that Jesus, the son of Mary, was a good teacher, that he was a prophet, that he was a miracle worker, that he was virgin-born, and even that he was the Messiah. So that's an awful lot of overlap, and it kind of explains why there are so many people today who want Christians and Muslims to come together to worship the same God, to look over the differences and build on the commonalities. But, and this but is a huge but, the God of the Quran, Allah, is not the same God who reveals himself to us in the Bible. They are not the same. In saying this, I have put this claim, this conclusion, right in the beginning of this chapter, and in the next couple of minutes I want to talk about some major differences which make it abundantly clear that this conclusion is correct if we follow logic and inference wherever they lead. We will first start with the fact that the Quran denies the Gospel entirely. That's the Incarnation, the Death and the Resurrection of Jesus. Then we move on to the differences in the nature of God. Christians believe in a triune God, the doctrine of the Trinity, which states that God is one in being, but three in persons, Father, Son, that's Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. One being, but three distinctive persons, which are in such a perfect and harmonic relationship to one another, that they are one in being. On the other hand, Tawit is the Islamic doctrine that God is one in being and one in person. One in being and one in person. And from that difference in the nature of God, many different characteristics derive. We will look into that after we have looked into the first point, how the Quran explicitly denies the Gospel. So before we know what the Quran might deny in the Gospel, we first have to know what the Gospel is. And a good definition for the Gospel we find in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 2 to 4. That's a passage in one of the many letters which the Apostle Paul wrote, and which we can find in the New Testament of the Christian Bible. We will read the passage from the New International Version, the NIV. By this Gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. So this is a very basic framework of the Gospel, which, of course, has to be explained in more detail to a person who has never heard the Gospel before. So I will do just that very briefly in the context of this introduction, and within the project we will look in more detail especially at the cross. So the first point which I mentioned on the previous slide is that the Quran denies the Incarnation. God coming to this earth in the form of a human being in Jesus Christ, a carpenter from the little town of Nazareth. Why is this important in the context of the Gospel? Well, for a very simple reason. Christ came to die for our sins. Sin is something which separates us from God, and Jesus came to bridge this gap for us. Since God can only accept a perfect, unblemished sacrifice to cover the sins of mankind, Jesus had to be sinless. He had to be without sin. He was tempted in every way as we were, but he did not sin. We can read this in the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 4 verse 15. He was able to resist sin because of his divine heritage, because of his divine nature. He always had a heavenly, a divine father, and when he came to earth, he also got a human mother. So that's the first point, the incarnation, indispensable for the gospel. Then Paul mentions Jesus' death. And we know not only from the Gospels, but also, for example, from Roman and Jewish historians how Jesus died, by crucifixion. The cross is the center of Christian faith. 
According to the Bible, Jesus paid the price for our sins, for our transgressions of the law, on the cross outside of the city walls of Jerusalem 2000 years ago. He died so we can live. He died so we can be justified before God. Therefore, Jesus' death on the cross is indispensable for the gospel. And then the third point, Jesus rose again after he had been buried. God vindicated Jesus and reversed the human verdict. Therefore, he declared Jesus to be not guilty of blasphemy when he called himself the Son of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, Paul says that the resurrection of Jesus is indispensable for our salvation. So, this is basically the framework of the Gospel, which is quite easy to memorize. Let's see now how the Quran explicitly and implicitly denies those three points. First of all, the Quran denies Jesus' divinity. There are several passages we could go to, for example, Surah 517, or Surah 17, 111, or Surah 112. So, you can see, this is a theme throughout the Quran, and it is an important one, since it is repeated so often. As for us, we will only read Surah 4, Ayah 171. O people of the scripture, do not commit excess in your religion, or say about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was but a messenger of Allah, and his word which he directed to Mary and his soul, created at a command from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and do not say three. Desist. It is better for you. Indeed, Allah is but one God. Exalted is he above having a son. This verse is, of course, directed towards Christians, the people of the scripture. Therefore, this verse is a direct attack not only on Jesus' divinity, but also on the doctrine of the Trinity. That's pretty straightforward. Everyone can see this, and no devout Muslim will deny this. How adamant the Quran denies Jesus' divinity gets abundantly clear when we look at the sanctions which the Quran puts forward for those who commit shirk, that's the term for the sin of idolatry, of worshipping multiple gods. According to the Quran, Surah 5, Ayah 72, those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and God himself will spend eternity separated from God. In other, more plain words, they will go to hell. So that's the first part of the Gospel which the Quran denies. The divinity of Jesus, the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus. Then the Quran goes on denying Jesus' death on the cross. And we, that's Allah and his messengers, cursed them for their saying, Indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumptions. And they did not kill him for certain. That was Surah 4, 156 to 157, again from Sahih International. And again, there is no need for interpretation here. Muslims today will still hold to the claim that Jesus was not killed by crucifixion. How then do Muslims reconcile what happened 2000 years ago and which is attested to from so many independent sources? Well, there are different streams within Islam which have different arguments. Some say that Judas Iscariot, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, was disguised as Jesus and died in his place. Others say that Jesus survived the crucifixion. Whatever it was, according to the Quran, Jesus did not die by crucifixion. And therefore the Quran subsequently denies the resurrection as well. How can anyone be raised to life again when he or she was not dead before? So this alone should be enough to convince anybody that Islam and Christianity are not reconcilable, that they are not two sides of the same coin. But as mentioned earlier, there is more. Let's now talk about the differences in the nature of God and what those differences in nature imply. We already introduced the two words Trinity and Tawit. Trinity as the Christian doctrine that God is one in being and three in persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
Tawhid as the Islamic doctrine that God is one in being and one in person. Now, some people might say that this is detail work and not a big issue. But when we look closer, we realize that this is a fundamental difference and that the characteristics which are derived from those different natures of God cannot be overlooked. Let's single out a few examples. First of all, when we look in the Bible, God is often described as both. Let me give you the first of the two examples displayed here. The God of the Bible is distant and he is also near. What does this mean and how is this possible? Well, let's start with God the Father. He is in heaven. Therefore, he is kind of distant. The Bible says, for example, that nobody has seen God except the Son. John 6.46 But then there is also Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. He was also called, as prophesied in Isaiah 7.14, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus walked among us here on this earth. He ate, he slept, he was a social person. And after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven again, and according to the Bible, he is seated now at the right hand of the Father. But he said that he would not leave us as orphans, John 14, verses 16 to 17. His Father would send the Holy Spirit, and this Spirit of truth would live inside of those who ask for him, Luke 11, verse 9 to 13. So, summing up, God, even though he is one in being, is distant, transcendent, but he is also very near. The God of the Quran, on the other hand, Allah, is totally distant and transcendent. No Muslim would ever expect God to speak directly to them, maybe with the exception of dreams. And then there is this issue of justice and mercy. The God of the Bible is just and merciful. Allah, on the other hand, has to choose either one or the other. So let's think this through. Allah and the God of the Bible are described as beings who will judge every person individually in the light of how those persons have lived their lives, what they have thought, what they have said, and what they did. How then would you describe a judge who sanctions or punishes wrong behavior according to a law or a code of conduct? Just think of it in human terms. Think of somebody who has been convicted of a crime and the judge passes a verdict according to the law which punishes this wrong behavior. How would you call such a judge? A just judge. A judge who serves justice. And then, on the other hand, how would you describe a judge who would overlook a crime? The defendant has been convicted and the judge says, I still let you go. I know that you are guilty, but I decide to let you go. This would be merciful, but it would not be just. How would you call such a judge even after human standards? A corrupt judge. He would be corrupt. So we see, justice and mercy are mutually exclusive. And Allah has to choose either one or the other. The God of the Bible, on the other hand, can be both. That's exactly what we see when we look at the cross. On the cross we see God's justice when he punishes his son Jesus for the sins which he has voluntarily taken upon himself. And on the cross we see how God extends mercy towards all humanity. The price for sin has been paid. Therefore God can pardon us and still be just. That's a huge difference between the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran. And then one more difference before we come to a final conclusion. The God of the Bible is love, while Allah cannot be love. Now, my Muslim friends might get angry with me, since this is actually one of Allah's 99 names, Al-Wadud, the loving one. But think about this. Muslims believe, as well as Christians do, that God created everything, this universe and everything in it. This means that before that, since Allah according to the Quran is eternal, Allah was alone. And love by definition requires an object. Therefore, Allah is totally dependent on his creation to be able to love. And even if he was loving, he had to learn to love because he wasn't loving before. Allah cannot be the definition, the embodiment of love. 
The God of the Bible, on the other hand, has eternally existed in a perfect and harmonic and loving relationship within the Trinity. God, even without his creation, is love. And therefore, we read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, those three words. God is love. He is the embodiment. He is the personification. He is the very definition of love. Now, finally, let's come to a conclusion. There are three possible conclusions to what we have just discussed. Either Islam is true, or Christianity is true, or both Islam and Christianity are false. That's also from a logical standpoint possible. What cannot be is that both Islam and Christianity are true at the same time. Not possible. Even though it sounds nice, you know, two sides of the same coin and let's come together and worship the same God in different ways, for those who value logic and reasoning and truth more than peace and political correctness, there is no option number four. Today many people are afraid of being politically incorrect or to disturb the peace. But this is something that a person that decides to follow a certain belief, a certain faith which has an absolute truth claim, should consider in the decision-making process. For example, the gospel in its very nature is offensive. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That was John 14, verse 6. Jesus did not say that he is another way among many others, but that he is the only way to God. Therefore he said that all the other ways do not lead to God. And yes, this is offensive. Either it is true, then Jesus is worth following wholeheartedly without any compromises whatsoever, or it is not true. If it is not true, then the Christian faith really doesn't matter at all. It might provide a good moral framework to live by, but that's about it. So this was kind of the introduction within this introduction, before we get more specific with regards to the topic of this project, the cross in the Torah. Why is it important that Jesus, his life and his death, is actually mentioned in the Torah in the five books of Moses? For once it is important since Jesus claimed that he was already mentioned in the Torah. And should this not be the case, then we could go and close down every church on this planet since the entire gospel would be undermined. Remember, part of the gospel is that Jesus was sinless. What is lying? Lying is a sin according to Exodus chapter 20 verse 16. It is one of the Ten Commandments. And if Jesus was lying only in this one instance, then he could not have taken on himself our sins as the unblemished and perfect sacrifice before God. With that in mind, we could turn to our online Bible source and start looking for Jesus' name in the five books of Moses, only to not find him. The closest we get to the corresponding Hebrew name of Jesus, Yeshua, is Yehoshua, which is Hebrew for Yeshua. Jesus or Yeshua is not to be found in the Torah. So where is he? Before we look into the shadow principle, which will help us to discover Jesus in the Torah, let's read some scriptures in which Jesus and the Apostle Paul claimed that Jesus was mentioned in the Torah. First, let's read John 5, 39-46. You, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So that's the first time Jesus claimed that he was mentioned in the Torah, and he made the very same claim again in the Gospel of Luke after his resurrection. We read in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27, He, that's Jesus talking to his disciples, He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
So Jesus explained his disciples what was written about himself, and he started in the Torah. In addition to those two statements of Jesus, also Paul mentioned in the very end of the book of Acts that Jesus was mentioned in the Torah. In Acts 28, verse 23, we read about Paul's contact with the Jewish leaders in Rome. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God, and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. So Paul tried to persuade the Jewish leaders, starting with the law of Moses, in other words, the Torah. So, having read those statements now, we are committed. We have to find Jesus in the Torah, or the Christian faith is futile. And this is how we finally come to the shadow principle. First of all, it is important that we talk about the scriptural basis for this principle, because we can construct many nice-sounding theories, but if they are not backed up by scripture, we cannot be certain that there is even the smallest amount of truth to it. With that being said, let us look into Paul's letter to the Colossians. In this letter, Paul addresses some wrong beliefs and also some wrong behaviors in the church of Colossae. One of those wrong behaviors mentioned was that the Christians in Colossae had started to observe a calendar. We read in chapters 2 verses 16 to 17, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Paul says that, for example, religious festivals and the Sabbath day were just a shadow which pointed towards the reality which is found in Christ, in Jesus. Let me give you a brief illustration from real life which makes this approach more understandable for us. Imagine a person who wants to travel to a foreign country for a certain amount of time and for a certain purpose. This person would probably have to apply for a visa, for a permit from that country to enter and stay. To obtain this visa, the amount of information which needs to be provided varies depending on the country the person is applying to. However, it is common to all of them that the questions do not stop with the name. Key information are usually required which make a person unmistakable and unique. Information like date and place of birth, name of mother and father, nationality and gender, what is your profession, which countries have you visited before, do you have criminal convictions, and the list goes on. If this profiling is done to a certain degree, the name almost becomes irrelevant. The person is described so well that the name is unmistakable. The shadow principle does exactly this. Jesus as person is only mentioned by name in the New Testament, in the four Gospels and in the Book of Acts. On the other hand, his shadow comprised out of many key details concerning his person, his nature, and his death on the cross can already be seen in the prophets and in the Torah which is part of the Old Testament. This shadow points towards him as the substance of the shadow, the person who would come much later. In the case of Genesis 22, about 2000 years later. As a side note, typology is the more technical term within theology which refers to the exact same principle as the shadow principle. Also in the letter to the Hebrews, the shadow principle is a major theme. Constantly Jesus, the substance, is compared to the shadow of the Old Testament, and constantly the author points out that Jesus is better. Jesus is a better prophet than Moses. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. Jesus is a better priest. And Jesus is a better sacrifice. One passage especially, Hebrews 9 verses 13 to 15, underlines this. So I hope that you now understand where we are heading and what we are looking for. If not, I trust that you will understand it after you have watched the upcoming episode about the first book of the Torah, which is Genesis. At this point I would like to mention a couple of further resources. You can see them listed on the screen. Especially the Unlocking the Old Testament series from David Pawson on YouTube is a real treasure. 
one of his teachings was what actually inspired this entire project. And here I come back to the story which began in Iran. After I had done my research on this religious celebration of Eid Gorban, I prayed about what I should do, and in the end I participated the following day. I had also prayed that God would open up a door to talk with my Muslim friends about God and the Gospel. And he did so. In the course of this conversation, it was surprising to me that my Muslim friends actually believed that we worship and pray to the same God. I wanted my Muslim friends to see the Gospel and also Jesus from the Christian perspective, which I wholeheartedly believe to be true. Jesus was not only a good teacher and a prophet, but he was and is the Son of God and the only way to the Father. This was and still is the motivation behind this project. I want people to see Jesus for who he really is. So, in the end, let me guide you through the project poster so you can better find your way around. At the very top you can see a chain running from the left side to the right side. On the left you can see a question. Is it reasonable to believe that the Bible is reliable and truthfully preserved? This question is important since Muslims believe that the Bible has been corrupted. And since Muslims are beside Jews the main target group of this project, we will first tackle this issue. We will do so in four categories. New Testament, Old Testament, language, which is a fascinating topic in itself, and then finally science and reasoning. And after we have looked into the subject of the reliability of the Bible, I am absolutely certain that anybody with an open mind will agree to the answer which is given on the right side of the chain. Yes, it is reasonable to believe that the Bible is reliable and truthfully preserved. Then we start to look into the individual books of the Torah. The transition on the poster is the same as we have done just a couple of minutes ago. Jesus claimed to be already mentioned in the Torah, and we asked the question, where is he? And then we will start to look for him in the Torah, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Within the drawings for the respective books of the Torah, you will notice a distinct separation. One part of the drawing is representing the Old Testament, the other part the New Testament. One part is portraying the shadow, and the other part the substance with Jesus on the cross. You have certainly noticed that the separation is mainly horizontal. However, Leviticus is an exception. In this book of the Torah, the separation line is vertical. This was a graphical way of getting the shape of the cross also into the structure of the Torah drawings. Then, at the end of this project, we will summarize what we have learned and ask two very simple and very important questions. First of all, whom does the Torah foreshadow? A victorious military leader or a suffering servant? It would be helpful to keep this question in the back of your mind for the upcoming chapters. And then, secondly, we asked whether Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. This is supposed to be an encouragement for those of you who have not yet made up their mind who Jesus is. Alright, I think that's it for this introduction video. I trust that this project will be a blessing for you, as it has been for me, and so I hope to see you in the next episode, which will deal with the reliability of the Bible. Be blessed and until next time, goodbye.